I'm Sana Ajmal and I've been living with type 1 diabetes for around 24 years now and involved in advocacy within Pakistan and internationally for a decade. When I was growing up, I noticed that while I myself felt very lonely with diabetes, I at least had access to the basic human insulin and two uh, to three test trips a day. People living in the remote areas might be truly disadvantaged um, with no trained healthcare professionals available thereby and insulin access a huge problem in such conditions, knowing others with diabetes, were there any others with diabetes at all? It was a question that I still am asked by a number of people coming from these remote areas. That is why Meet Zindagi was established and initially working as, a, as Pakistan's first and only diabetes community organization, we stepped up to uh, become the representative for the diabetes community in Pakistan. And now I'm going to switch to, um, to a slideshow to show you some pictures and stories because I believe that whatever I'm going to talk about will not have an impact unless there is some visual connection to the stories that are being shared. So I'll pause for a little while. So before I continue, uh, let me tell you that all pictures and stories are shared here with consent. However, to avoid any uh, any assumption that we might be uh, that people under uh, people benefiting from it might be um, might be indirectly uh, pushed to share the stories and uh, pictures. I have tried to convert all the pictures into a painting uh, so that the children are not recognizable. However, all these stories are true stories and uh, the pictures are also shared with consent. So what are the what is advocacy near us? So advocacy begins with the community rallying around a cause and in Pakistan, there was no community. There was no concept of anyone knowing another person with diabetes. When I was growing up, my uh, my doctor helped me meet a number of people with type 1 diabetes through her support group sessions that she was holding within her clinic. But that was a small group that I knew and I did not know anyone else with diabetes. So with the with with internet coming in and social media, um, social media helping more and more of us connect, uh, the community started building, and uh, there are around two thousand community members uh, on our Facebook support groups now, and they've all uh, they've all found us through random internet searches. What needs to be done here? When 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 I started my journey as an advocate, uh, I often used to used to find people feeling very stigmatized and very unsafe about sharing their stories but a major change that has that has come in over these uh, over this last decade is people proudly sharing their stories because they feel good about themselves they know that they're incredible they know that they have they have suffered but they have also uh, they have also um, uh, been through all this with a lot of courage and a lot of resilience, which has helped them uh, be who they are and they're proud of themselves. So with the goal of nothing about us without us, we, we embarked on developing uh, a methodology for, 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 for nurturing these advocates who could, who could actually uh, raise their voices for a cause. Now, what was the first thing that uh, that was a common common theme occurring again and again and again amongst the community members that we were trying to serve um, um, from the stories that we were getting all the time from our community groups? The most common theme was the restricted government support. So uh, the government uh, does provide insulin and some in the tertiary care hospitals for type, people with type 1 diabetes. However, uh, in most of the hospitals, the only insulin available is premixed 7030. In some rare hospitals, you might find regular and NPH. No test strips are supported, no glucometer, nothing else, not even syringes. Though ISPAT says that choice daily regimens are discouraged, uh, especially in cases of food insecurity. And you can imagine that the people uh, going to these public sector hospitals are generally the people from the, from the most, the bottom of the socioeconomic classes because, because uh, nobody in Pakistan who can afford a dime would 
would spend would would ever go to a government hospital because of the uh, because of the services because of the healthcare teams being overburdened and uh, there are a few very good hospitals as well but uh, in general the government hospitals are overloaded and the services are not up to the mark so uh, here is the story of daim daim has been tied once since two, uh, 2019 and he's around 7 or 8 years now uh, daim was consistently uh, going into severe hypoglycemias at night however the hospital that he could access only offered 7030 and uh, his family stopped giving him insulin because of the fear of those hypoglycemias so when daim came to us he was in a uh, he was not in a very good condition because he was having uh, nighttime hypoglycemia uh, and severe hypoglycemias and his family would either stop the night dose or cut it down to a bare minimum level uh, which meant that the child was not being provided the total dose that he needed so this is how our promise of insulin program was conceived specifically for people who could uh, not access the insulin that they needed uh, and be provided flexibility in uh, insulin regimen options which could be tailored to the child's needs now let me talk about this this is a child who was facing nocturnal hypoglycemia but let me tell you another story uh, this is a very recent picture around less than a month ago this is less than a month ago now this child ramesh he lives in a uh, in in a remote area in mithi uh, which is within the tharpakar desert in pakistan this uh, you can see his house behind him it's made out of straw the child has access to less than 2 meals a day and uh, the nearest road from his house is at a distance of 20 minutes tough walk there is no hypo support available we do not have glucagon in pakistan and the child of course has no meals to eat what to talk about the juices and everything else now this child was also on uh, premixed insulin and uh, what we have seen is that it is not just always i i think as as uh, my role as an advocate um, makes me say this that it is not just always the government that is not providing the right kind of insulin uh, or is not providing the flexibility in treatment options but also sometimes um uh, acceptability for these newer kinds of insulins uh, that come from the healthcare teams so though we provide even analog basal bolus to children who uh, who might have face who might be facing food rejection problems because of their issues with prebolusing and the time required for human insulin to start acting uh, we still find that specifically from remote areas there is a there uh, 7030 or premixed insulin continues to be, to be the most favored prescription and these are the most difficult settings as well so what we need is unequivocal loud and clear advocacy and clinical guidelines to stop the usage of these premixed insulin in children where you can at least with where where at least the supply chains or the um, um or support from any government organization or a non government organization allows uh premixed insulin should not be uh, prescribed to children when there is when, when there is so much at stake the another issue that came up as a theme again and again and again was the long waiting lines and availability issues both at the government sector hospitals and at the charities um, that are supporting the causes so uh, neha's father told us that it costs him a full work day uh, to just get her insulin and for a child for whose whose rest of the life is uh, uh, requires him to go to the hospital every month and get that insulin it's a terrible terrible option specifically when these people are daily wagers 24.3% of our population lives under the poverty line uh, so um, we as a community member we with our boards and community members sat down together and uh, we decided that we're going to work on a flipped model and what that flipped model is i'm going to explain in a little while so what we do is that we provide insulin to these children at their homes uh with the condition that they visit their doctor once every 3 months or as required by the doctor 
Now, this little child, Khadija, she died, uh, she passed away at the age of uh, two months. She was born with a pancreatic uh, malfunctioning pancreas and had other uh, issues uh, such as epilepsy associated as well. The place where this little girl lived was at a two hours hike from the nearest uh, dispensary, which did not have any uh, any proper uh, health care available. So it was like, a, it, it is more like a makeshift clinic. Uh, this child required one unit of basal insulin each day, only one unit. And it was not available at the at the government hospitals. She passed away due to an epileptic fit when her family could not bring her down from the home to the nearest dispensary for medical care. So people may need to travel long distances without proper node network to access care. And when we as, as diabetes organizations and as health professionals say that we're providing the care, we also need to think about how difficult it might be for anyone who requires this care to come to us and access it. And that is what, uh, that is what we all need to uh, join hands for to make that access problem easier. So distances and long waiting times continue to be a huge access issue in Pakistan, especially in government and charity healthcare settings. Most of the government hospitals that provide this care and most of the charity healthcare settings are based in the in the main uh, main cities, which do uh, have a catchment area, which do uh, see people from uh, the remote areas as well. But just imagine how how difficult it is for a family to travel to get this uh, support every month. So we looked at the ways of flipping the model. And I've just explained to you that we are providing it at their homes through coach and maintained courier um, every month with the requirement that they visit the consulting doctor once every three months, or if the doctor requires it to be earlier, they need to visit them earlier. Can we, can we as advocates, my message to all of you is, can we think about flipping this model for every setting that has similar issues. Now, uh, one of the requirements of our insulin support program is to attend school because we believe that attending school is important for future, future productivity. Of course, this is only for those areas where, where schools are uh, accessible uh, and where children can actually uh, uh, actually feel safe at these schools. 22.8 22 million children in Pakistan aged 5 to 16 are not attending school as per UNICEF. Uh, around 30% of the children who come to us for insulin support are out of school uh, and are put back into school after, um, after they uh, start acquiring. Uh, the support. Some of them have left school because of health conditions. Some of them have left school because uh, they were not feeling safe and were discriminated. But schools need to make safe spaces for children with type 1 diabetes. And we're still thinking of if digital ca awareness campaigns can help and trying to implement some as well. This is a huge area of work and we really need, um, the world really needs to join hands with this to ensure that schools in the remote areas, those small schools where, uh, where uh, no proper education system is present, and when these children from remote areas, from the underprivileged backgrounds, they go there, they feel safe going to these schools with type 1 diabetes so they can lead productive lives later on. This is Abdullah, and Abdullah's future can be as bright as his smile. I love this child's smile. Why not? Why why should we not think about this? Why should we only think about improving his HbA1c? Uh, will improving the HbA1c alone really make a difference? Um, we really need to think about quality of life. We really need to think about putting smiles back onto these children's faces. So one of the ways that we do it is through diabetes camps. Uh, and it is, as it is said, it doesn't get better than camp. These are fun-filled, hands-on learning for children and families where uh, adults with type 1 diabetes take care of groups of children with type 1 diabetes. And this is modeled with support from Diabetes Education and Camping Association USA. Uh, the last time we had one for two days in a mountainous area, and there was a child who started crying at the end and said, why can't this be for two months? 
this is the kind of support that they need they really want to talk to others like their own they really want to uh, they really want to feel safe in a space where they're not judged for their blood sugar levels for example where they're not judged for their food choices where they're not judged for anything where they are respected and taken as humans with choices which may be right or wrong and guided as per their their acceptance level and their uh, their own uh, way of, uh, of 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 thinking about how they should move ahead with improving their diabetes care so, uh, the power of social media is huge now what we do is that these groups of course these camps cannot be held every other day these camps cannot be accessed by everyone so what we do is that we have made peer support uh, accessible to anyone with an internet connection of, of course there's still some gaps here where we need to see how to make this accessible for people who may not have smartphones or internet connections who may not be using social media however for those who do uh, this takes diabetes self management to the next level it is monitored and led by volunteer community leaders who are adults living with type 1 diabetes these are safe spaces for experience sharing and helping each other feel better and also learn about managing uh, diabetes better uh, these there are very organic open discussions on these groups and um, and people learn a lot people even when they're not even when they're not talking themselves even when they're not asking questions or responding to those people learn a lot through these groups and then of course when you are talking to a lot of people online you also want to meet them so uh, in three big cities in pakistan we have the therapy days uh, once a month these are self help support group sessions designed to change a person's perspective on life with diabetes every session is based on a certain topic which is a topic selected by people from that city and uh, um, emotional emotional well-being with a chronic condition like diabetes is supported using cognitive behavior therapy tools and you know what the community was the one that uh, pushed us to start flood relief work uh, when floods came into pakistan uh, the summer and uh, these were horrific horrific floods um the community members got down uh, together and they kept on requesting that we should do something for children with type 1 diabetes in these areas and that's how we started our flood relief work uh, you can see this picture um, you can see the child uh, he does not have shoes proper shoes he does not have a shirt to wear and our teams which are also based on a lot of volunteers from the community are going from village to village house to house knocking doors asking if there is a child they know with type 1 diabetes who might be needing insulin uh, and they're distributing this uh, uh, the supplies they're taking doctors along and doing all this amazing work um, in these areas in interior sind as well as in the south of punjab so here's the community here's the community which is the first thing that's important when we talk about advocacy the community rallying around insulin access the community rallying around empowering education and peer support they co-creating the resources they co-creating the projects they co-governing them and co-executing for great lives with diabetes and also collecting and compiling data to build an advocacy framework in our setting which is an experience rich setting but a data less setting so uh, we're working on data collection to make sure that our our advocacy is data driven in the future so thank you for listening uh, and if you're interested in discussing more here's my email address and i look forward to feedback on this uh, talk and um, any other things that you want to discuss about thank you so much for having me